Uh, welcome to the 2023 virtual tall poppy secondary experience. This is session B today. And we have four presenters with us today who are going to talk to you about their experiences as tall poppies. Just before we get too far in, um, my name is Anthony Simcox from Quantum Victoria. Uh, and I'd like to just acknowledge uh, that we meet on what was all and always will be the land, in our case, of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, we pay our respect to Elders past, present and emerging, to the sustainable way in which they care for country and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the wider community and beyond, including all those who are listening in today. And obviously there will be different um, parts of, uh, of Australia that uh, you would all be listening in on, and our presenters, I think, come from multiple different parts of, of Australia with different um, people from different nations. Okay, <clears throat> so the agenda today, uh, we've just got through most of what I, my welcome there. We've got four tall poppies today. We've got um, Dr. Ma uh, Michael, Dr. Vesalius, uh, sorry, Dr. Michelle, my apologies, Michelle, Dr. Michelle, Dr. Vesalius, Dr. Deborah, and Dr. Sonia. And what we're going to be doing is we'll have them each um, go through and they'll talk to you a little bit about their experiences and how they got to be tall poppies and all, all of the things that they currently do. And then after that, we'll do a question and answer session. And the question and answer se session, uh, you all will all have your cameras um, turned off and your mics are muted. So if you have a question, uh, we'll get you to put tell your teacher and you can put those questions into the chat window and we can then ask the questions of the um, the tall poppies at, in, during the question and answer session. Um, and hopefully we'll get through most of the questions in that session. All right, so what we might do is we might try and keep this going as quickly as possible. So we'll start with Dr. Michelle and we're going to get, um, she can go through and start. So she's taking control, so uh, we'll leave it up to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So what I thought I'd sort of start with is just a little bit about my research and what I what I work in. So broadly, I'm in public health or population health, and our focus is on getting people to live the healthiest life that they can live. So my main areas are around getting people to quit smoking or vaping, uh, not drinking sugary drinks, minimising alcohol consumption, minimising junk food consumption. Um, and we look at this across sort of all aspects of the lifespan as well. So we want to sort of what we do is work on a life course approach. So it's not just, you know, adults who need to, you know, live healthy lives. It's also very young babies, children, even, you know, um, while children are still in the womb, we want to encourage mothers to, to make sure they're not drinking, for example, right through to older adults. So the population is getting older. And so we've got a lot of people who are in that older age bracket. So how do we encourage them to be exercising um, and engaging in uh, physical activity or, you know, eating healthily fruit and vegetables. Um, and then on top of that, you know, we create programs that will help people do this stuff. And then we also evaluate those programs. You know, we want to know, is this stuff actually working? Because if it's not working, we don't want to keep investing money into it. Um, now, of course, you know, it's not just at the individual level that we want to be doing this. A lot of the focus um, when we think about, uh, what we call harmful industries, so the tobacco industry, the vaping industry, the alcohol industry, the gambling industry, the junk food industry, fossil fuels, um, sugary drinks industry, all those industries, what they do is they blame the individual for the situation that they're in. They say people have a choice about whether they drink or smoke. You know, we're just providing them with the product. It's up to them as to whether they choose to do it or not. Um, and that's a, a, a very not helpful way of thinking about things. So what we also try and look at is what change we can uh, put in place at sort of the broader level. Um, so can we make sure that when people want to exercise that their built environment is relevant to that, that there's a park nearby that they can go and 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 do that exercise at, that when they go to the shops that there's they're not confronted by, you know, very cheap alcohol products or very cheap tobacco products. 
So that's what my research was on. And the reason why we I focused on that is because, you know, when I first started out, I uh, was deputy director of the WA Cancer Prevention Research Unit, and we were co-funded by Cancer Council WA and Curtin University. So our goal or our mission was around you know, looking at things and looking at um, looking at behaviours that that cause cancer, and try to encourage people to do things that you know will reduce their risk of cancer. So we worked with the SunSmart team uh, to encourage people to you know slip, slop, slap, seek, slide. We worked with the Crunch and Sip team, which worked on you know getting kids in primary schools to eat fruit and vegetables and drink water. We worked with the Food Sense team to encourage healthy eating on a budget with low socioeconomic status groups, uh, and we of course working with um, similarly with Live Lighter, Make Smoking History as well with the um, their tobacco campaigns and now their vaping campaigns, and also did a lot of work with the National Drug Research Institute around alcohol. So that was uh, my life for for five years, and then um, wanted to get over to Melbourne because I'd always wanted to come to Melbourne. So I packed up, I left all my family behind, and moved to Melbourne, and became deputy director of the Melbourne Centre for Behaviour Change. And we have, you know, very similar missions to to WACPRU back in Perth. We really want to do research that's going to make a difference, that's going to result in improvements to people's health and wellbeing. But also, part of what we do involves improvements to the planet, uh, to the environment that we live in. What do we need to do to make sure that people are recycling, uh, reduce the risk of bushfires, um, and you know basically encouraging sustainability and and uh, reduce the impacts of climate change. So that's what I do and who I work for. What I thought I'd sort of talk about briefly is sort of what I thought I would do. I studied clinical psychology, so I thought I'd just be a therapist in a room sitting opposite someone, uh, helping them achieve the life that they want to achieve. Now, what I actually do looks very different and sort of that's one of my sort of lessons is, you know, being open to new experiences, being open to moving to a different state or to a different country or to doing something that you didn't want to, that you didn't think that you would do. So I didn't get the job that I wanted to get. And yet I found myself on a completely different path. And now I look back and I'm really glad that I didn't get that job that I applied for. I was devastated at the time. Um, but now I realise I would never have been in the position I'm in now had I gotten that job. So what I actually do is a lot of writing, uh, some teaching, a lot of meetings. I still do a little bit of clean psych work. Um, occasionally you'll see me on the TV talking about vaping and what we need to do to, to reduce vaping. Um, and then a not so pretty picture. This is sort of the day to day. We're writing grant applications, but we're also mentoring. So I'm a firm believer in not just doing research so that it sits behind a paywall and someone has to pay $40 to read that paper that I wrote. I really believe in um, sending research out there and making sure that the people who need to read it actually do get a chance to read it. So we're writing press releases. We are trying to get onto the radio, get onto the TV, doing media interviews, um, a lot of supervising and mentoring the next generation um, to improve capacity building. So I just thought I'd end on sort of my uh, take home message around, this is a quote from Joseph Campbell, we must let go of the life we have planned so as to accept the one that's waiting for us, which may be amazing, but until we're sort of open and willing to that, um, we sort of miss can miss some opportunities. So that is all from me. Thank you. I think Vasilios is next if uh, he wants to take control. Yes, thank you very much. That was absolutely excellent. So, um, Vasilios, I think we'll just go straight on to you, and you can um, talk to uh, the the students and and teachers about what you do. Thank you so much for the opportunity um, to present to you. I guess quite similar to Michelle, um, what made me a researcher had to do with um, the social challenges related to the area of my research and the questions behind it. And this is what I'm going to mostly talk about. So gaming is the area of my research and I'm examining risks and opportunities in relation to gaming. Now, what is the challenge? We live in a country that consumes, produces video games and trains future game developers. 
we have more than 70% of Australians involved with digital gaming in some in some form or frequency, according to the Digital Australia Report 2022. We have a thriving gaming industry, production industry in the country, with a, a 26% increase in revenue within just one year. Um, over 280 million value. Uh, the local game production industry has over 2,000 employees and 30% of it is Melbourne based, our city. And this industry is expected to further grow after the introduction of the digital games tax offset, 30% for all the gaming companies since last year. Uh, and at the same time, we train future game developers and we have more than 30 game development um, courses delivered by Australian tertiary institutions, including my own university, RMIT. And while moderate gaming and gamified applications for health, what we call serious games, promote well-being and benefit users, excessive gaming or disordered gaming um, has been shown to compromise them. And according to a coroner's report triggered by uh, the unfortunate uh, incident of the suicide of an adolescent in regional Victoria in 2019, uh, the country, our country, appears to be lacking resources in terms of how to address gaming disorder. So, uh, and also not to forget, according to the, to the records of the Department of Education and Training, we have 46 adolescents around your age uh, being currently homeschooled due to a gaming disorder diagnosis, and that's the official record. Um, so, as you may see, we, there's an impending, there's there's a there's a compelling need to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks related to digital gaming. Now, how does my research aim to address this challenge, and why I'm interested in it? I'm aiming to assess gaming disorder related risks in terms of what makes games absorbing or addictive. That's one main part of my research work. And another main part is to realize health related opportunities um, considering digital gaming. When it comes to risks, I mainly investigate three things, what we call telepresence, online flow and the user avatar bond. So what is telepresence? Telepresence is the level one is absorbed by their digital context and they feel as if they are there. So when a user uses um, a game application to experience the game world, but they forget the mediating role of the technology, they end up feeling there. They end up feeling what we call telepresent. It's like looking into a landscape through a window frame and forgetting the frame. You feel as if you are there. And I bet that some of you have experienced that. I have at least when I'm gaming. Now, what is flow in gaming? That's another thing. It has to do with the way Let's say that one's level of skills is re represented with the level of game challenges is that high. One's level of skills needs to be slightly lower for them to feel engaged and challenged because if it's significantly higher, they feel boredom and they disengage. If their skills are significantly lower to the game challenges, they feel distress and they also disengage. But the more one games, the more their skills increase. And therefore, game challenges need to also increase proportionately. And this is a part of the game design to introduce what we call level up in online games or online flow in my area of research. And finally, what is the user avatar bond? Um, it actually reflects the absorbance by the experience of oneself online, which is expressed by their customized in-game character, the avatar. And what we do know in psychology, in the area of research of mind, is that the user is connected with the avatar via what we call identification. I am what my avatar is. Immersion. My avatar's needs as a, are experienced as my own needs and may be often prioritized to my real life to the real life need to sleep or eat in cases of excessive gaming. Relief of repressed desires. My avatar can do things th there in the game that I wouldn't allow myself to do in my real life. And finally, idealization. My avatar to an extent represents who I would like to have been, but I'm not in a position to.
And it's not only the user who affects the avatar, it goes the other way around. So the avatar can affect the user through what we call Proteus effect. So some players, not all of them, but some of them to an extent, start feeling, thinking, or even behaving like the avatars in their real lives. And this is what I'm mostly interested in. Why people experience the game world as real, their game activity as absorbing, and their connection with the avatar that strong to the extent that they may start behaving like it. Now, what are the opportunities that my research is mostly interested in? There's interested in. It's something that we call digital phenotyping. Uh, so it's an opportunity to translate one cyber behavior, including the way they relate with their avatar, into health and mental health information about them. And how we do that? We use algorithms or machine learning techniques analysis techniques to translate, to decode one's connection with their avatar into health or mental health information about themselves. And the way we do so, because machine learning or artificial intelligence is an equation which is alive and learns through data how to interpret other data, is we have a big data set, we divide it into a training part and the testing part. The training part is always bigger because as human beings need more repetitions to learn the same two algorithms. And then we put in a recipe with predictors and we say to the algorithm, predict certain things. And then the algorithm gets trained and finds a way to learn. So what we do in my research at the moment is we put in the way one connects with their avatar and we find out and we have achieved that to find out who is depressed who is anxious who is more likely to behave like their avatars in their real life and who is at gaming disorder risk thank you uh, and i apologize if i over consume time thank you so much i think the next um, speaker is about to start uh, you're actually very much, uh, pretty much as as we were coming to the time, you finished it up. So that was really nicely done. And thank you. That was really interesting information. Uh, so next we have um, Deborah. So uh, Deborah is going to, well, uh, she's already taken control, I think, there. So I, I think we'll leave you to it, Deborah, and you can uh, let us know what you do. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thanks for having us today. I'm really excited to talk to you a little bit about zoology and ecology. So I started out um, as a kid growing up in England and we don't have as many different species of wildlife in England. So I really liked animals generally. And I would go horse riding and I liked dogs and cats and all of the pets, but I didn't really know much about what my career path would be. When I came to Australia, I thought that when I grew up, I would be a vet or I would work in a zoo because that was the only jobs that I really knew that existed working with the different animals. And when I was in high school, I got uh, a work experience placement and I, they asked us what we wanted to do. And I said, I just wanted to work with animals. And they placed me into Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, which had a colony of different kangaroos and wallabies and rat kangaroos and a whole bunch of different wildlife that I got to work with for the week. And so I would go out with the rangers and we would go and rescue possums from people's houses and we would go out and chop down different trees for the different wallabies to be eating. And I met this animal during that week. This is known as a thorny devil and it's a species of lizard that lives in the desert. And it's got these crazy adaptations to allow it to live in really desert environments. So when you put these thorny devils into a pile of water, into a puddle of water, what you can see is capillary action transplants the water from the puddle that they're standing in all the way up through these really deep grooves in their skin and eventually to their mouth. And so essentially, these lizards can drink through their feet. And I thought that that was the coolest thing that I'd ever seen. And so I decided I wanted to work in herpetology, which is the study of reptiles and amphibians. But at school, I hadn't done very many science courses. And when you do zoology or you do ecology, you do a Bachelor of Science, you really need to have done some chemistry and some maths and some biology when you're at school. 
And so what I did was I enrolled in the university course and then I did bridging courses. And so I wanted to make sure that everybody knows that even if you haven't done the right subjects at school, you can find other ways to do those subjects, either through TAFE or through bridging courses at the university, and you can get entrance to a university degree that way. So if you haven't done the right things at school, don't worry. When I got into the Bachelor of Science course, I absolutely loved it. And my favourite part of the course was going on adventures and helping different scientists do research in different areas. And so this is me, the first time I ever went to the rainforest. And I thought that it was going to be this amazing romantic adventure and I'd be swinging through the trees like Jane and Tarzan. And when I got there, I realised that the rainforest is actually, it's a really hard place to work. It rains all of the time. There's leeches and ticks. The leeches get into your eyeballs. And there's this wait a while vine that clings onto you when you try and walk through the forest. But I absolutely loved it because there were all, all these different animals. There were tree kangaroos that lived in the trees and there were leaf-tailed geckos and cassowaries and all these amazing animals. And so I kept doing research. I did a PhD and I moved to South Australia to work in the Murray River. And I caught turtles for three years and I studied how these turtles have responded to all of the changes that we've made in our river systems. From there, I've done lots of different adventures through science. This is when I went to the Kimberleys and found crocodiles and we were researching um, different freshwater turtles that live in the dams up there. I've been to Jamaica and worked on these Jamaican iguanas, which are one of the most threatened species in, in the whole world. There's less than 80 individuals left and they're threatened by pigs that run around and eat them. I camped in the Amazon, so you can see these little hammocks that we were living in under this roof shack. And we had to have fly screen on our hammocks because the vampire bats will come and suck on your toe during the night if you don't have a mosquito net to stop the vampire bats. And they have these diseases that they carry. They can give you rabies, so you have to protect yourself. And we looked for anacondas and all these different amazing animals in the forests of the Amazon. I went and lived in Madagascar for a year. And in Madagascar, there's an amazing radiation and speciation of all these really different plants and animals. So this is me with a tenrec, which looks like a little hedgehog. And it's more closely related to other things that look like shrews and mice than it is to other hedgehogs in the world. And there's lots of different species of chameleons and lemurs all through the island. It's a really remarkable place for a biologist. So as a, my job as a scientist, I spend lots of time reading and learning and finding out what other people have found out about different questions. Sometimes we're looking for money so that we can do experiments. We'll collect data, we'll analyse that data so there's a little bit of computer work. Sometimes we'll go out into the, into the rainforest or the river and we'll collect data on different animals. And we spend a lot of time observing, working in teams, sometimes budgeting, lots of writing, more writing, and then this, science communication and talking to other people about science. A couple of other pathways that friends of mine who did the same degree ended up in. Um, these are a couple of rangers who spend time burning fires and managing different national parks to make sure that lots of animals can survive in them. This is my friend Lee who spends time in a helicopter and she'll go out and burn different national parks to get rid of weeds and make sure that they don't have wildfires. This is my friend Lauren, who owns a consulting firm up in Weeper, in the very top of northern Queensland. And so she spends time having to go out and catch snakes and different reptiles up there in the tropics. And this is my friend Karen, who um, works in the Great Barrier Reef. And she goes out and does surveys underwater by snorkeling and looking for coral. So if you're interested in science, you can start now. There's lots of different citizen science programs out there. This is TurtleSat, which is an app that we have created so that people can get involved with turtle conservation. So check out onemillionturtles.com and look at different opportunities if you're interested in um, science degrees. I'm here at the University of New England, which is a really good campus because we're in the middle of the bush. So we've got four different types of rainforest around us and we've got lots of access to different different plants and animals around the place. So if you like adventures and you like traveling and different wildlife, this is a good way to go. And I'll pass over now. 
Wow, um, that uh, <laughs> that sounded a little bit scary at times. There, <laughs> sounds like you've had a lot of <clears throat> lot of fun there. Thank you very much for for that. Um, so what we'll do is um, we'll now move on to Dr. Sonia. Um, if you can, you've already taken control, I think. So um, we'll leave it to you, and um, we will hear what you you get to do. <laughs> not to traveling to so much places. I have traveled to so many places, but not as exciting as that. And probably I'll be very scared. I'm, I'm easily freaked out. So thinking of like, you know, bats sucking my toes from, it, it's just, it's very exciting. <laughs> but I guess I am uh, happy to contain my ex excitement to experimental physics in the labs. <laughs> so this is my story. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I am speaking from, the Turbul and the Yagra, and where QT resides as well. So I have a little video to introduce uh, me and what I do, where I come from, and in a uh, very succinct way. And after that, I'll go into a little bit of detail about wh what I do, what I thought I would do, and what I am ending up doing right now. So here it is. So that's me in two minutes. So as mentioned that um, I grew up in a village in a remote corner of India. Then after that, I actually moved to the capital city of India to do my bachelor's in science in physics honors and then master's of physics. So I've traveled quite a bit. Then I moved to NUS to do an internship. That's the first time I actually got to handle like really high technology, like very uh, in strong microscopes that can actually look at atoms, etc. So that is my first experience of exposure into real research. Then I happened to get a chance to actually go to the US to actually do my PhD there. So I did a master's there and I did uh, my PhD and I spent four, uh, four years in Texas, in Houston there. And after that, I moved to Queensland. So after two weeks after finishing my PhD, I actually came to uh, the University of Queensland to do my first postdoc with, for three years. And after that, I moved to QT. I have been in Queensland the whole time. I became a research fellow there, and now I'm an academic at QT, which means that I not only just do research, but I also teach undergraduate students. So there were two things that actually happened in my life, which I think were very important in mapping the trajectory of how my career is going to be going to be. One is that the first one is that happened in grade six and they were all very serendipitous. I wasn't planning to do any of those. So firstly, I got into a selected school and the next thing that happened was during my master's. I wasn't planning to give an interview for a PhD, but my friend just called me and said, hey, there's an interview. Let's go and give it. And so I actually went to give the interview and this is, was for a PhD and University of Houston. So I got offered a scholarship and then after that, everything is history. So I went to the USA after that. So I wanted to study physics because I was attracted to the stars and the story about Stephen Hawking and the black hole, etc. And uh, you would have seen it recently in uh, the news that uh, the Indian Space Research Organization had this uh, landing on the South Pole of the moon, right? So Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, was functional at that time, was there from a very long time ago, when, even when I was a child. But then there was no internet. I had no one in my... Um, in my family that worked in the space research organization. So information was very limited. So even though I wanted to be a physicist that works in space research or related technologies, it was just kind of an impossible task to kind of uh, dream for it. So I, I actually didn't get to do what um, I really thought that I was very interested in, but also because information was very limited. When I think about physics, this is all I know at the time, like space, going to space and designing rockets like that. But I'm very happy that uh, my journey has turned out to be different, but it has turned out to be very well aligned with the some of the natural instincts that I generally have, and I'm very much enjoying that. So what I'm doing these days is really hands-on experiments in the lab. I make these diodes or these lights. This is one of the things that I do, that I make 
diodes or lights that which actually goes into the, your phone screen. So I make things electronics better, faster, more long lasting or more sustainable like that. And my research is also mostly driven by curiosity, cur curiosity that what happens if I do something different? So for example, I want to de design electronics that can be at the interface of biology and electronics, like just like at the interface of Luke Skywalker's hand and how to make it work. So those kind of things, those kind of curiosity drives my research. And when I reflect back in my life, I think that that is very much driven by what I do as a hobby. Like I like very hands-on things that I like cooking. I like growing things. I like making my hand dirty and doing some experiments. So this is what I really enjoy. And it has become very well aligned to my research. And one of the privilege that I have as an academic at the university is that uh, apart from writing about my research and trying to find money is to influence the next uh, next set of curious individuals. And I try to that, do that by connecting the science that they learn in their classrooms, say simple physics like light bends when it goes from one medium to the other, which you can see by putting just a pencil in a clear uh, glass of water. It's very important for your te new technologies like your mobile phone displays. Say that's because the light that is coming out from the mobile phone displays has to pass many layers. And if you put simple physics, then you know that some of this light is going to go back. So what do you study in physics in first year or high school becomes very, very important for doing cutthroat technologies or technologies that people are researching on currently to actually improve people's lives. So that's about me and my research. Thank you. Sounds great. <clears throat> that's, um, that's something that I, I think I would have enjoyed doing too. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do now, we've uh, we've got a session now where we're going to do some questions and answers, and hopefully what we'll do is we'll have a few questions which um, our uh, our presenters will be able to answer. We do have a few questions that we had, um, which were we got a little bit earlier on, and so I'm just going to maybe um, ask the the main uh, question, and that is what is the one thing that you think would be really, really useful to the students out there if they want to go into your field of study? What's the one thing that they you think that they really should try and do or try and be? Can anyone give me a starting point on that? Um, I can. Oh, sorry. Yep, me go. <laughs> OK, so while I was in high school, I really thought that physics is different from chemistry. Chemistry is different from biology. It's like I had this partition that maths is maths, you know, very divided. Now that I am here doing my research, which is at the interface of physics, chemistry and biology, which sometimes involves mathematical models. So I I thought I wish I had done more biology, like I stopped doing biology after grade uh, 10 thinking that oh I I am not interested in remembering long names and you know like knowing about all these uh, cells and stuff like that but um, I, I I think I was just very naive at the time that science is very compartmentalized I do not think that science should be treated as like that it it becomes a stage where everything is so interrelated that I need a lot of chemical physics knowledge to be able to design my electronics which is semiconductor physics, and I am trying to interface it with biology. Now I'm doing crash courses in YouTube to understand how the cell works. So I think that's something that if people want to work in my area of bioelectronics, that everything, knowledge of everything is very important. Uh, did you have something to, uh, to add to that one, Michelle? Oh, I was just sort of thinking about it more from a logistical perspective in terms of um, university and and the study that would be required to get to get into our areas. So there's the logistics around it and and that stuff. But then there's also sort of I think you know certain qualities and and um, I alluded to this in my presentation. You know being open and uh, to new things. And I think you know when I was in high school, what I wish people told me is that no matter how far down a road you go you can always turn back if it's not what you wanted and try again 
Um, I think there's a lot of focus on this is your path and you must take this path no matter what. But I think flexibility is really important. So that's what I wish someone told me. Nice. <clears throat> I, I think there's a fair few people who um, look at it from the point of view as well. You, you've got to enjoy what you do, I think. And um, I think um, getting to do things that you, you like and things you enjoy are probably one of the big things that um, you want to be uh, looking at when you're going through school. Um, so we also uh, have a, a couple of other questions. Now, one of the things I did notice is that, um, uh, well, today we've actually got we got three uh, three ladies and one gentleman today, um, and out there there's probably a lot of uh, of young boys and a lot of young girls, and they're wondering whether science, a particular part of science, is something that they can do. Whether it makes a difference if they're from of a particular gender or if they're from a particular background or anything like that. What do you, what would you say to the people who have asked who asked that question? I can take that one. So um, the thing about science is it doesn't matter if you're a boy, a girl or a non-binary person, everyone can do science and science benefits from having a diversity of people. So people from different backgrounds, people with different genders, people with all different abilities to approach things from a different angle. So whilst there are some areas um, that still have different ratios of genders, it's something that we're trying really hard to turn around and to show all of you out there that we need people with all different skills and abilities and backgrounds to do the science. Nice, yeah. I think that's a fairly important thing. There's a lot of people who think that just because it's dominated by a particular in, um, career is currently dominated by a particular gender or a, or a particular people of a particular background, that doesn't actually mean that it's it's the way it's going to be in the future. And I think things are moving a lot more these days, so we don't have to worry about that sort of thing at all. Um, so the other question that we get very regularly asked um, it comes as a two-parter. Um, do you get to travel much for your jobs and go to conferences and things? And the other question is, does it matter what you're paid and, and do you get paid enough to, to make it worthwhile? Anyone want to uh, tell, tell them all about the things that you've done in your <laughs> travels? Um, I can chime in on that. Um, yes, I personally do get to travel for my job. I get to travel a lot, sometimes well, too much, actually. It can be quite exhausting. Um, but it is a great opportunity to go and see different different parts of the world. So um, there was a World Public Health Congress conference over in Rome in May that I attended. But there's also, you know, a lot of domestic travel as well, especially, you know, if we're having to meet with government representatives, we might need to be in Canberra. So there is a lot of travel. Um, which is a perk of the job. Um, that's probably all I would say about the travel. Having talked about the travel, I'm not a parent. So I imagine if you're a parent, it might make it a bit tricky to travel. But if there are any parents uh, who tour poppies that would like to speak to that, I can uh, mute myself. Uh, I guess I guess I can I can take over here. So I'm, I am a parent. I have a two years old. And I was last week in Korea and I had to be without my family and without my son and he was unwell. Um, and it wasn't something that I would have chosen otherwise, but I felt that, you know, I'm committed. I was committed to that conference. It was a very important conference for behavioral addictions. Um, and I had to be there, but it was kind of a struggle this time. Yes, we need to travel a lot and yes, when you become a parent, things change. Uh, but I would also like to, to attempt to address the second part of the question about the cost. And I think that most of us here uh, allow me to talk representing you know, the, the academic world and are not paid proportionately to the effort they make. So we, I believe, and I may be generalizing the wrong way, please correct me if that's the case, 
that on average we end up working more than 10 or 12 hours, especially when we have grant writing, publications, deadlines, um, we are stressed and I don't think that this is getting paid as well as in my field, let's say clinical work. But it's commitment and we are committed because it gives us meaning or it gives me meaning, speaking of my own self. Um, I find it challenging addressing different questions and gradually more um, specific questions. I, I have a sense of belonging to the community of researchers within my field. I feel we communicate really well and I feel they understand me. So it's a kind of another meaning direction. It gives me purpose. This thing with the gaming and balancing the risks and, and opportunities within a highly, a rapidly digitalizing world. It gives me definitely a purpose. And, and finally, it has to do, I think, when it comes to me, to my personal narrative, who I am and what I want to contribute. So yes, there is a cost. If you ask me whether this job is well paid compared to the effort I feel I make, and I would dare to generalize to an extent, expressing a proportion of researchers, it may not be the case. But is it meaningful? Does it make me happy? Yes. Does it make me unhappy? Yes, too. <laughs> so when I get rejections, when my grants are not successful, because of the level of investment effort I put, I feel, um, I feel disappointed, but then the level of knowledge we contribute, or I feel I can contribute to the society um, at the next step of the journey, makes me happier and I find that rewarding and this is what keeps me going. I'm not sure if I'm representing all of us or if I address the question the right way. I'm just closing here. I think you, you did that very nicely. I, I think the, um, the main message is you get into any job, I think, to to actually get fulfillment out of it, you've got to enjoy your job. And I think if you get paid for something you enjoy, that's probably just almost a bonus. So, um, but as far as travel goes, travel's travel's a big thing. I think you can probably find in any field lots and lots of opportunities to travel because uh, when you're young, it does seem like a great thing to do. After you've done it for about 35 years, like I did, it's probably not as much of a fun thing to do, especially once you do get children, as you've said. Um, but there's always those sort of opportunities. Um, <clears throat> so we probably uh, have still got a couple more minutes. Um, so what I might just uh, ask, um, there was a particular question that we had, which was for Deborah, and that was about all those scary things that you you had in some of your trips and things. Have you ever had um, some a, a thing where you've actually been injured or something really terrible's happened to you and 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 it's made you um, rethink what you've had to do? Oh uh, no, but we did have a interesting adventure the year before last when we were working on an unregulated river system. So that's a river where people haven't put in dams to control the water level, which means if it floods or if it rains higher up in the catchment, it can flood a lot more than some of the rivers that we're used to. And so we went to catch turtles by the side of this river and there was more rain than there was than was predicted. And we got essentially surrounded by water on what we called Mud Island um, for two weeks. And so we had to be a little bit uh, adventurous. We had to eat yabbies for food and fish, which we were catching in our turtle traps. And we had to, you know, use the natural toilet system. Um, and it was okay because it was really interesting because there aren't very many people who've been in the middle of a flood and had the opportunity to collect data. So we were able to use it as a really good scientific natural experiment to go out and see what all the different animals do during a flood. Um, but it wasn't something that we planned. And so I think if you end up doing field work, ecological field work, you have to have a good sense of adventure. And, you know, I've had a leech in my eye and my friend pulled it out with some tweezers and I've had ticks in various places and chiggers, which, you know, can be uncomfortable for a time. And so you do have to sometimes be able to rough it through some pretty gruesome situations. But the feeling of coming home from the field and having your first soft drink or your first shower, um, getting comfortable again, it just makes you appreciate it so much more. So I think it's worth it in the long run. And I really enjoy the adventure part. 
I'm, I'm sure Michelle probably doesn't go home and have soft drinks. Is that right, Michelle? You, you. <laughs> Does anyone else have any any of those sort of uh, stories where you've had something really strange happen, or something that hasn't hasn't gone quite as you planned? Um, I'll, I guess I can briefly talk about um, my experiences working in the vaping space. Um, that's an area where that I'm very passionate about, but it's obviously a very um, heightened topic at the moment. So the stuff that goes wrong for me is usually a lot of trolling, um, a lot of people sending messages to me personally on, on Facebook, um, a lot of yeah, a lot of not nice stuff that gets said about me on Twitter and my research. I actually really love it when that happens because it means I'm doing my job right. If the industry isn't yelling at me, if the industry isn't calling what I do rubbish, then I'm not doing my job right. So although, you know, obviously it's not nice having people say that about your work, I've got a really strong network of people around me who also do work in this space. And it's actually, you know, we've reframed it as being a good thing. That sounds great. Um, one there for Sonia. Sonia, you uh, did briefly mention that you were really interested in the space side of things. And you also mentioned the Indian uh, moon landing and everything like that. Did you get to um, participate or did you know anyone who participated in, in that and made that possible? Because that only just happened very, very recently and it's quite exciting. Yes, it is very exciting. No, I didn't know anyone. I mean, all I know is from the news only. So like I said that at that time, like probably they didn't have a website when I was growing up and we didn't know what internet was when I was in school. And also because, um, you know, things here are a lot faster than how it happened there. Like I got my first laptop when I was in my PhD. <laughs> so it's like, it's very different from the world we live in today. So I don't know anyone in the space research organization, but at the at, and now stories are coming out that people from where I grew up are also working and they are the deputy directors of some of the streams for that um, uh, launching of that uh, satellite and then the uh, landing on the moon, et cetera. But then, at that time, I didn't know anyone at that time. And it's I got to know now that some people from the town that I grew up works there only because of internet now. <laughs> so at that time now, at that time, no, I mean, I had no idea like what other things that you get to know are only from newspapers when there is a job advertisement or there is like about a scientist in the newspaper, then probably we I could have written letters to them and to ask like how to get into that. Like so, yeah. But it was, yeah, I didn't get a chance. I think we've got a time for maybe one more question, and and we did have one from a little bit in the earlier session, and it still works with this particular thing, and that is you've all been doing research um, and getting uh, research studies and things like that. Um, what's involved in creating a research study and how do you go about it? Do you, who do you ask and what do you need to do to be able to get into something where you're researching something? Um, I'm happy to answer that. Um, I guess we get the, the training when we were doing our PhDs and when we were doing our uh, when I was doing my postdoc. So essentially in the beginning, obviously we didn't know what type of questions to ask, but it was a lot of training during my PhD time that my supervisor would ask me to read the available literature on particular topics. So I did my PhD in solar energy, flexible solar cells, like how to make flexible solar cells. And so there were a lot of uh, literature already out there, like how all, a lot of research groups all over the world, what are they focusing on and what is their main challenge that comes out after reading a lot of research papers. And obviously with a lot of help from my supervisor that we could frame the research question by reading those literature as well as with his guidance. And um, after that, like it becomes, I guess, a natural um, instinct or habit like by reading uh, around and not just in my field, but also in surrounding areas of research that whether I'll be able to apply my knowledge and expertise in making these electronics to for like say uh, drug testing or for some narcotic testing, testing, etc. So it's like um, 
you 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 are an expert in your own field, but also an awareness of what is happening around so that if there is a gap, then you can just fill in the gap. So that's also one of the ways I look at and try doing. So I think most of the training was done during my PhD and postdoctoral stage. And with experience, of course, now, like I find it easier to identify research problems. Uh, but that's, yeah, it's, <clears throat> I think it's one of the things that a lot of students who are going through would start going, oh, where do I start? What do I do? And I guess that's the whole thing. You you start um, by going to, to do a university course and through that you get experience and you learn and you go through. So I guess it's not really that scary, though, at, at the end of the day, is it? You, you basically just, it, it happens. No, it it, uh, it is very daunting before you knew anything about it, but I think like there's a systematic way of learning everything. So, I mean, no one was born knowing how to do research. So I think we can all learn. And I think just to note that people do research all the time, you know, like if you're buying a new iPhone, you want to do your research on which iPhone is the best. So the process, it's the same. It's you're collecting data, you're figuring out the pros and cons, and then you make a decision based on that. And so you don't necessarily, we we've talked a lot about PhDs, but these days um, universities are building research, mini research things within undergrad courses. And I'm sure that high schools are also doing little research projects as well. So you get a sense of what it's like to do it and whether it's something that you're interested in. You don't necessarily have to then think about, well, how, how am I going to do a PhD? It's figure out whether you like it at this stage first. Yep, I think Vasilius, you had something you were trying to say as well. Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm partially covered by Michelle and, and Sonia um, when it comes to the method of addressing the question. But I would dare to say that the research question um, is not yours initially, the community. And you come in devoting your time and solar panels or uh, zoology and what you know all of these things or gaming these these are social questions these are the questions in the community and then in a way your mission as a researcher is to provide evidence to address this social or community question for someone else to take a decision because as scientists our work is to provide evidence so that policymakers or those who design interventions finally take decisions based on evidence. So it's like your mission is to find the truth in, in a methodologically um, integrated way, in an appropriate way. But the question I would dare to say is never yours. You are echoing the question. The question is around you. You are voicing the question. The question, the question always belongs to the community. So the starting point of research is you being sensitive about something that is important to the community. And then you find yourself in a mission to provide evidence. That's how I would describe the beginning of my journey. Nice. Uh, apologies if I talked a lot. No, no, that's that's great. <clears throat> no, I think that was a, a good way of sort of summarizing that that whole thing of at the end of the day, every everyone is there to do some sort of a service for someone someone else. And uh, it, even if you're not a scientist, even if you're just someone cleaning the streets, r emptying rubbish bins, whatever, it's it's all uh, in service of something that someone needs. Um, so, and I guess you guys just happen to be in the one where you get all the exciting stuff, and occasionally the if you if you Deborah get the the reasonably uh, dangerous stuff as well but <laughs> I'm sure a lot of scientists actually get into that dangerous that dangerous territory but it's all about being safe as well all right so what we're going to do now we've actually got to the point where we we've, we're going to just finish up what I want to do is just let everyone who's listening in know that we will have a uh, survey for students and teachers to go through so that we can get an idea and hopefully improve these for future sessions um, but I'd like to just thank everyone um, who has attended today and all those people who are going to be listening in 
um, to the recorded session. And I'd very, very much like to thank all of our tall poppies today. The, the We've got four very brilliant people today and uh, it's really, really great that they've given up some of their time to be able to talk to to everyone here and give a little bit of the wisdom that they've they've been able to gain as they've gone through in their careers. So thank you all very, very much.